everyone present here today and these are our national uh, headquarters of the first square gospel church in nigeria all glory be to god hallelujah amen by the way my wife and i consider ourselves live members of this church eh? i haven't sat there for over 40 years do you agree with that oh yeah you are live members so we are not strangers at all again we consider it a great privilege for me in particular to have been uh, invited this second consecutive year to minister from this pulpit this exalted pulpit on a sunday morning like this on the family more so after my former retirement from the current nominal role of uh, first square minister you know you have to retire at 70. <laughs> but then uh, i'm still being invited i'm grateful for that i i clocked the uh, 70 last year march march 30th praise the lord praise the lord we are particularly grateful to our daddy in the house the general overseer of our great movement Reverend Samuel and the Reverend Mrs. Olabisi Aboegi for this invitation. Thank you, sir, in absentia, is downstairs ministering uh, to the teens. Thank you, ma'am. First square in Nigeria, we continue to soar under your watch with uncommon anointing on you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Again, it's our prayer that all of us will be met at the points of our needs this morning through the ministration in the mighty name of Jesus. Your expectations will not be dashed. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Father, we bless your name. We worship and adore you for another beautiful Sunday morning like this. Thank you, Father, for this month in particular, which is our family month. The family is so central. To everything without good homes there are no good churches without good homes there are no good families and they were grateful lord that we are emphasizing on the family we pray that all that has been said and all that will still be said lord will not be lost to any of us in jesus name they will serve us the way you designed them to be in the name of jesus our families will know it for the better your name will be glorified. Thank you, precious Father. This morning's message, Lord, you will meet us at the points of our needs. To the glory, honor, and praise of your name. In Jesus' wonderful name we have prayed. Amen. I've been asked to minister on the topic, marital fidelity. That's a big topic. Because that's everything that makes marriage click. If we key into everything, every thing that has to do with what marital fidelity before i go further i want us to read uh, from the scriptures genesis 2 18 to 25 that's where it all started and the lord god said it is not good that man should be alone i will make him a helper comparable to him out of the ground the lord god formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to adam to see what he will call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the bells of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman... And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two of them shall become one flesh. The Bible says they were naked before each other and they were not ashamed. Glory be to God. Marital fidelity. What's, uh, what's marital fidelity? 
It entails a loyalty, devotion, faithfulness to one's spouse, including abstention from cheating or extramarital affairs. Now, the Christian husband and wife are meant to relate to each other as soul or covenant made in accordance with the word of God for the couple at creation. We all uh, know what Genesis uh, uh, 1 26 says where God said let us make the man and the woman in our own image. That's God talking there to the other persons of the Holy Spirit. In our own image, after our likeness. Of course, when you talk about in the likeness of the Trinity, you are talking about what? Unity of purpose. Praise the Lord. No third party is allowed to infiltrate the union. Of course, it is the covenant or oath-taking aspect of uh, or aspect to marital union at solemnization. That when the two people are brought out there and they were joined together, that covenant taking is what makes the ordinary, intimate, and the sincere promises of soul communion sacred and life binding. In other words, ordinarily, soul communion is meant to uh, be an intimate thing. It's meant to be a sincere thing, open thing, in which uh, the husband and wife could perhaps literally read into each other's life or into, into each other's mind. And that's why he said, and they were naked before each other and they were not ashamed. Now, the solemnization procedure at Christian weddings and its subsequent implementation, because we are meant to put to practice all those stuff that we will read out but, uh, at the altar. But a lot of people read out those things like parrots. You know, once they turn their back on the ministers, on the church, out there, they just begin to misbehave. They just begin to do what they like. Play night and seek with each other. See? So, but then, let's take note that all that husband and wife read to each other, they say to each other, on the altar at solemnization, are meant to replicate, to copy all that happened when God gave Eve to Adam as wife, you know, in the Garden of Eden. These are the things we have read out to us. Now, of course, you discover that the same injunction is brought to the fore. In uh, Malachi chapter 2, uh, verses 13 to 17, we're not going to turn to it, where God was lamenting over uh, married people in Israel, say, saying that uh, they have uh, reneged, they have gone back on their promises. They say you are dealing with yourselves in treachery. Treachery is a violation of mutual trust that husband and wife repose in each other at solemnization. And so anybody that goes contrary, that goes contrary to the tenets of the marital vow is guilty of what? Treasury. Treasury. And the God doesn't uh, uh, play with that. He doesn't take it lightly. You see, he went further in that passage that he hates putting away it's not when you have divorced your wife or husband that uh, uh, you have put away. You could put him away, you could put her away in your mind. And even in your action at the home front, everybody is doing what he or she likes. God says he hates putting away. And he said that's why prayers of many couples are not being answered. The Lord will have mercy on us. In Jesus' name. You will discover that various woes and negative relational emotions have continued to plague mankind's marital and interpersonal relationships. See, up to date. And that began from the time sin crept into the union 
of Adam and Eve at the Garden of Eden. I said all forms of negative relational emotion. The only positive relational emotion that exists is what? Love. Every other relational emotion is negative. And of course, it showed after Adam and Eve had partaken of the forbidden fruit. And of course, after that had happened, they were pricked in their consciences. They began to nurse guilty conscience. And it was guilty conscience that created fear in them. See, I'm beginning to mention what constitutes negative relational emotions. Fear has crept into them and uh, they made away. They took away. They, they took to their heels. Not just that, we also noticed that insincerity crept into that relationship. What do I mean by that? See, secrecy. They covered themselves up. We are told earlier on they had been naked before each other and they were not ashamed. Secrecy, sleepiness. Let's begin to score ourselves. You see, insincerity is big. You see, it's uh, plaguing many marital relationship. It doesn't just stop there. It goes on to hostilities, hostilities, snappy responses. What do you want? Leave me alone. Snappy responses, snobbish responses. You saw that happening again when. Cain's offering to God was not accepted. You know, God came to him, was trying to help him out. And he said, if you do well, would you be, would you be accepted? He didn't, he didn't listen to God. For when God asked him, where's your brothers? He said, am I my brother's keeper? Can you imagine that? Snap back at God. And I said, these are some of the things that are happening in our homes. The Lord will have mercy on us. In Jesus' name. Notwithstanding, Christ, our Lord, has since come to restore the short-circuited relationships at all levels. Glory be to God. In Ephesians 2 verse 14, the Bible tells us that Jesus is our peace. And he has made them one again. He has broken down the middle walls of partition between us. So, husband and wife who keep on re-erecting the broken wall of partition, God will help you. Yes, to begin to fix them again. As we listen to this message in Jesus' name. So, the message this morning emphasizing, emphasizing some factors that will ensure quality and total fidelity or bonding between husband and wife. Remember I said earlier on, my fidelity talks about loyalty. Responding to him, responding to her the way he or she wants you to respond. Pleasing each other. You know, being one, spirit, soul, and bodies. When you are one in your spirit man, it talks about both of you serving each other. Your spirit man is subject to him, is subject to her. You are not full of yourself. You will behave, you will respond as he or she will want you to respond for the betterment of the relationship. You will also not just serve together, you will also share together. You share. We'll talk about that in the bit more details as we go ahead. And of course, you also sense together. You sense together. So let, let's, let's begin to talk around about them. I'm going to make four statements which I will dilate on. I pray the Lord will help us to catch them. In Jesus' name. Now, number one, the couple respond. Couple who are put into practice marital fidelity, that's what I'm talking about. They respond to each other with sacrificial, scintillating, serene, and smart disposition in all circumstances of home life. Let me try and break that a bit. Sacrificial. That is, husband and wife go on deliberate missions of fulfilling each other. I gave some details teaching on that somewhere last uh, Sunday. That was at Akute. But we're not going to, uh, that's not going to be the main talk today. But suffice it to say, at this level, see, 
that we begin to ask ourselves some questions. Now, men, for instance, how are you sacrificing for your home? How are you sacrificing for your wife? Do you see your position at home as power or provision position? What do you mean by that? For a good number of men, all they are interested in at home is their food and, of course, uh, the bed. Nothing more. They are not interested in serving, in sacrificing. They put uh, almost everything that needs to be done at home on their wives. No programs for providing for the spiritual, physical, no mental and emotional needs of their wives and children. It's a spiritual. I, I remember there was a couple they were having some uh, uh, conflict over a small issue. And in the point, the lady beckoned on the husband, let's pray. The man said, the Holy Spirit tells me not to pray with you. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Is that one, is that, is that, has that one started at all? It's Neil. As if he's born again at all. And these are people in church. You know, meeting the spiritual, the physical, the physical needs, providing food as God blesses you, and God will bless you, man. You have in Jesus' name. Providing funds, money, providing fabrics, wears. Dress your wife, you dress your children up. Of course, they will help. But it's our responsibility. God will help us. God will bless us as men in Jesus' name. Uh, I'm not a uh, hypocrite. All these things I'm telling you, I, I did them and I'm still doing them. By the mercies of God. You provide fabrics, you provide fun. You sing for your wife. Men time. We got women come about asking questions. How do I do this? And all that. You know, some men will throw the question about why do you want to do it? Leave me alone. Huh? Are you a baby? That kind of a thing. Providing for the mental, providing for the emotional needs of your wife and children. That's what Christ did for us. The Lord sees his union with his bride, the church, you and I, as provision position. You know, just as the Bible tells us. Uh, husband, love your wives. That was read out to us this morning. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself to the church. You know, not a tyrant. We're talking about uh, the need for our men not to respond as tyrants, as dictators, you know, uh, as wife beaters. See? You sanctify her. You cleanse her with the washing of the word. Now it was something like family altar. is a man's prerogative. And God help you know, we must be alive to it. See? And of course, when we do that, when we are spirit, when we, are, we, we take on spiritual responsibility at our home, when our wives see us eh, as good examples, and they want to emulate us, that's the kind of thing that will be helping the home. So the question is, does your home draw her, or draw your children more and more? To the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, women, for instance, they are like flowers. If you plant flowers in some good environments, you water the flowers, you give the flowers, all the, they need, they will come out well, and you will love everything there. And therefore, the, uh, the home is such that the man will work on it in such a way that, I mean, he will turn around to love it. Come around to love you. That's the nature of women. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Now, women, let me, because we have to move fast. How are you sacrificing for your husband or your home? Are you a home builder or a home breaker? Proverbs 21 verse 19. Once our woman says it's better to live on top of the roof than to dwell in the same house with a brawling woman. A nagging woman, the woman who is always tagging at her husband, always trying to correct him. Now, do you, as a woman, demonstrate rapport? When you say rapport, it's a situation where your husband is always uh, looking forward to coming back home to meet you. Of course, if the home climate is not conducive, he wouldn't, he wouldn't want to. He will stay at home and come home late. So, you demonstrate rapport. You demonstrate meekness. Not flexing your muscle with him all the time. Meekness is not weakness. We can't go into details about all of this. You demonstrate support. Even when it's going wrong. 
You know how to handle it. The Bible tells you and me in First Peter two and so First Peter three one to two. He say, if a woman has a husband that does not believe, not necessarily an unbeliever, he said, let her without the war, without preaching, let her win him over to the Lord. Let her win him to our side in the Lord. See. So, we're talking about women demonstrating support, demonstrating reverence in times of conflict. You see, you ensure that you make all you do, can do all you can to maintain peace at the home level. Reference. You know about some women when they are into conflict with their husband. That is when, you know, the attitude changes. Maybe I didn't mean calling the man, uh, darling, there before. Then he just turns around and says, I did. Uh-uh. Uh, very careful. Take, take your time. I'm not enjoying what you are doing. And the man will be one. The reason I did now is <laughs> calling you. The Lord will help us. Are you providing as a woman what I call high class domiciliary services? You have the details of all of that in Proverbs 31. We are not going into any of such. So, sacrificial, scintillating. What do I mean by scintillating? Brilliant. See? Sparkling. Impressive. Amusing. Creating fun at the home front. When you create fun, when the atmosphere at home is relaxed, you discover that you'll be able to bond together. You'll be able to serve each other better. See? We're talking about you creating loving, gentle, and soft dealings at the home front, dealing with each other. A gentle touch, gentle talk, and tenderness generally will go a long way in enhancing the bond between husband and wife. Songs of Solomon 7, 6 to 7, describes to us a woman there, I mean a man there, Showing tender loving care for his wife. A3 tells us, same, same song of Solomon. He said, He puts his hand around me. That's miss, missing in many homes. Scintillating, something that is what? Amusing, something that is impressive, something that is what? Brilliant, exciting. We create excitement in our home. I said, We also uh, put up what I call serene. Serene is calm unruffled, peaceful. We ensure peace in our home. See? That is, uh, of course, we must realize that the serenity of our home environment, which in turn affects our loyalty to each other, is determined by the frequency and duration of the conflict moments between us. Of course, where there is no peace, there will be little or no loyalty to each other. Praise God. Oh, yet, conflicts of disagreeable moments are inevitable in every human, in every normal relationship. But then, we must not, as a result of conflicts, create what I call unnecessary tension in our homes, sadness in our responses to each other. See? Uneasy silence, no longer talking to each other. And then you are suspicious of each other. You keep making some noise. You keep saying, hmm, my God. Hmm? God will help me. And you're saying that so that the husband or the wife uh, could become somewhat disorganized. All these things are not necessary. In our homes, you criticize each other loudly simply because there are no going conflict. Conflicts will never end in every home. Are you following me? It's just that if we are doing well in our homes, the frequency of conflicts could go down. I've been married 43 years. I can't remember when I went into serious conflict with my wife last. You know, but uh, I'm not saying it's all over yet. It could still come. But as it comes, we make a to walk quickly, get them behind us. That's marriage. Glory be to God. And I talk again about the need for smart disposition. Smart talks about neat, well-dressed, fashionable not weird though. I'm talking about fashionable presentations within and without the home environment. It enhances our loyalty, 
our interest in each other. Now, you remember Queen Esther in the Bible, before her husband, her husband was on the issue of the contention between uh, Aman the, and uh, Mordecai. Aman on one side, Mordecai, the Israelites on the other side. And Aman promised he was going to get all of them exterminated. Of course, they waited on the Lord, fasted for three nights and uh, three days and what have you. But of course, we must remember, we must realize that I'm almost certain that Esther will probably not have been able to sail through with a request from her husband if she had presented shabbily before him. We are told in Esther 5, 1 to 2, after all the fasting, after all the prayer, she put on a royal prayer and then went before her husband. And he didn't even talk. He just stood at a place where she could be noticed. And the man was with the subjects. And the man said, oh, my wife is around. Eh? Excuse me. You don't went out and ask, oh, Queen Esther, what is, what is the problem? What do you want? Oh, I will give it to you, to the half of my kingdom. So, smart disposition. Between husband and wife can enhance our loyalty, our readiness for what? To serve each other. So, we must take care of our homes, our toilets, our bedrooms. She will reflect uh, our husband's desire. You know, our husband and wife are always quarreling over the state of uh, their sitting room, their bedroom, and what have you. You know why? The truth is that men are more ignited. Men are more uh, motivated, not ignited. They are more motivated to ignite love and closeness by what they see of their wives. You understand what I'm talking about? Whereas women are more motivated to ignite love and closeness by what they hear their husbands telling them. If you tell him good things, if you tell him things that excite him, you will get the best from him or from her. Praise the Lord. That's number one. Sam must move quickly. So serving each other acceptably we go a long way in enhancing our loyalty to each other. The second one, they share freely with each other their plans. This is the most challenging aspect of marital fidelity. Listen very well. They share freely with each other their plans, their inner being, their failures, their fantasy, their fears, their feeds, feelings, frustrations experiences out there. They talk their schedules. There are so many things you must share with yourself before we can say that uh, this husband and his wife uh, they really are into each other. There's real fidelity between them in their relationship. I said that is where the real challenge to marital fidelity lies. For many a husband and wife, that is to share intimately with each other on all fronts. Glory be to God. Sharing together as husband and wife is the most engaging aspect of our relationship. Since the natural human tendencies to secrecy and self-centeredness must be overcome. I hope you are following what I'm saying. Are you getting me? <laughs> you see, when you're talking about sharing with yourself as husband and wife, that engages our soul being. The first one engages our spirit being. Spirit being, eh? when you are prepared to be what he wants you to be, but you can serve him, you can serve her the way he or she wants, but then you are not, he, he doesn't know you. You don't know, you don't know her. So that's why I said sharing with each other is the most engaging aspect of our marital fidelity. Glory be to God. Now, so, the well-meaning husband and wife must do away with all attitudes of disregard, distrust, disrespect, and deceit. A lot of husband and wife deceived each other. The seed of each other, and of course, all of that run contrary to their marital vows at solemnization. You remember, at solemnization, we promise ourselves, let me remind you, friendliness. Friendliness. You told him, yes. I will take care of you. I will love you. I will cherish you. All that is talking friendliness. You promise the fidelity. 
Fidelity, I will know no other person sexually, for instance, all the days of my life except you. You are part of the covenant promises. You promise firm or sexual rapport, uncompromising sexual rapport. You will not know any other person, any other person sexually except him, except her, all the days of your life together. You also promise financial oneness. That's all fidelity is all about. Financial world, one, all my worldly goods, I do what and thou. They are yours. I, I grant you access into my inner person. All that I have and all that I am. Praise the Lord. Remember, we're talking about marriage being what? A covenant relationship. Remember the covenant promise that David and Jonathan made to each other. You see that in 1 Samuel 20, 8 and 9. They went to the field to talk. And at a point, David was not too sure that uh, Jonathan was not deceiving him into uh, bringing him before his father. He said, look, uh, be fair with me. Tell me the truth. If you know that your father wants to kill me, tell me. And you need to be truthful to me. Why? Because you are entering into the covenant of the Lord with your servant. That is the reason he desired what? Truthfulness. Covenant. Praise God. And of course, you remember how Jonathan answered him. He said, look, if he knew that he was determined against him by his father, he said, I would tell him. He would tell him. So, what are we saying? We're talking about the fact that covenant husband, husband and wife who truly understand what marital fidelity is all about. They share their plans with each other. See? Projects, business ventures, projections, all those things you share with yourself. Your eh, inner being. When you talk about your inner being, your fantasy, your dreams, your aspirations. Tell them to yourself as husband and wife. Your frustrations out there. You see, when you are frustrated, you have no faith. Maybe people are putting obstacles in your way. The person you need to come and discuss with her. Is your husband is your wife first before any other person. But the husband, a lot of husband and wife are not friends. That's a shame. You see, your fears, your feelings. You remember Abraham and Sarah as they approached Gera. Genesis 12, we are told the man. <laughs> became afraid. Then he turned around to his wife. said, eh, I'm afraid. This people will kill me. Eh? But tell, me, tell them, you are my sister. You know they have brothers and sisters. And if you do that, both of us will be preserved. Our lives will be preserved at the end of the day. And the woman said, if that's what you say, decision, why not? Of course, you know the story. Very well. Talking about sharing our inner being, our feelings, our failures at workplace, at marketplace with each other. But the problem with many of us is the problem of ego. We are so full of ourselves. Ah, a mere How can I tell my wife this? No, 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 no. I will manage it myself. That means you are not getting the purpose for which God put place, marriage in place. You see, experiences out there with your colleagues, your relations, your friends, and strangers alike. This is very, very well important. Very, very important. See, sharing with yourself experiences out there. See, I said this word is of utmost importance with relations, with friends, with strangers alike. All that you experience with them out there. And husband and wife should come back home and share. You remember the story of Micah? Micah, who was the husband? Bible students. Who was the husband of Micah? David. David and uh, you know uh, Saul wanted to kill David and they uh, wanted uh, his uh, daughter to help him out. Said, "Look, please get him for me." And the woman said, "Okay, he has had, he has had him." And uh, when the assailants came, we are told that it was that same woman that helped her husband to jump over the fence in order to escape. From Saul's ferocious attack. And just Saul came back, told the man, eh, Why did you allow my enemy to go? So why shouldn't I allow, allow, allow him to go? He's my, he's my husband. That's the way it should be. 
Praise God. Now, that's talking about how we should be close, how much we should be close to ourselves as husband and wife. You remember also the story of Jacob and his two wives. What were their names? Leah and Rachel. The man was going through some frustrations with his father-in-law Laban, was changing his wages. You know, and at the point, he decided to come and share his experience with his wife. And uh, after relating all that he went through with them, he would move and say, is that what he's doing to you? What is God telling you to do? He said, God is telling him to leave. He said, we are living. We are not going to stay here. Praise the Lord. Husband and wife solidarity is so important. So important. Time we fail me to tell you about Manuel. Manuel, you know, was spoken to by an angel of God. was going to have a child. The husband was not home. By the time the husband came back, the husband related that experience to him. The man said, no, no, no. He didn't want second-hand information. Let the man of God that was said, let him come back and tell us. He wanted to be part of child world or bringing. So we can keep talking and talking. You discuss your schedules with each other. Mighty fidelity is the topic for this morning. Your itinerary for the day, within and outside of town. You know, not just walking out on yourselves. I was going to do that. I remember many years ago, there was this guy, who was, uh, I think he was in the council of the church somewhere, and uh, he, he needed to come back after service or to stay long at home, I mean, to stay long in the church before coming back home. One of the days, as he walked out on his uh, wife, the woman said, look, where are you going? You don't ever tell us where you are going. The man snapped back. So what are you talking about? Are you suggesting that I'm running after women? You better be careful. You, eh? Why are you monitoring me? Is that a good response? But that's the way some, some, some men behave. You want to say, no, I just wanted to know so that uh, if he's not came home, eh, you'll be able to what? To tell him. You want to say, no, you're, you, you pretend that. <laughs> Praise God. Marital fidelity. You must share with yourselves. Is it your sickness? Chronic and acute. I must keep telling him, telling her, progress report. I, I remember that a colleague of mine was, uh, I, I was a consultant to his hospital. He had this bad hypertension, which eventually killed him. I was a physician to that hospital, but he didn't tell me. He didn't, he didn't bring me in to manage the thing for him. It was after I went into kidney failure that I got to know. Of course, you have to be placed on dialysis, which is just a short gap measure. Even the wife did not know about it. He died eventually. Died, you know, early 60s. He didn't be. Praise God. We must be open to ourselves as husband and wife. Of course, if you are told, if you are put the wife in the picture, the woman will have been monitoring the use of his drugs, isn't it? Because no woman wants to lose her husband that soon. Lord, will give us understanding. You discuss your success. This is the bulk of the teaching. You discuss your successes, especially on money matters. See? Which is one area many married couples as they share with each other. Especially when they operate what I call separate financial structures. Mm? And you say you are, you are covenant spouses. Mm? Covenant spouses indeed. Mm? The Lord will have mercy on us. In Jesus' name. See? Let us note that the extent of our involvement with each other in the area that I've mentioned, your plans, your inner being, your finances, and the, your frustrations, and the rest of them, your schedules, and what have you, is a good index of the depth of love and fidelity between husband and wife. Oh, some will snap back. Some of you will snap back and tell me, hey, you see, you don't know my husband. You don't know my wife. Eh? We don't see eye to eye on anything. <laughs> I laugh at you. See? And you married yourself. But that time you felt you had met the, you know, the best person in the world. But when challenges began to happen, you, 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 you started parting you know, from each other. God will restore you. I said God will restore those days to your union in Jesus' name. Number three. Say so I'm going to give you four things. The faithful or the fidelious, if I may use that word, couple plays pleasant importance 
on making joint decisions about their home and cooperating on various financial and social matters. Now, that's a very sensitive area I want to talk about now. Now, the married couple who really bond with each other who normally rub minds together as they deliberate on money matters such as projects, business ventures, you know, it's a joint thing. They and their children upkeep, they are talking about them, all these things together. School fees, house rent, mobility, some, some men are buoyant, they have money. Eh? And they see their wife jumping into one vehicle or the other. These are people who even have structures outside of uh, their uh, home of domicile. See, how do you explain that? They can't be bothered about their wives. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. My wife rode a, 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 a new car before me. <laughs> eh? Oh, yes, that's where it should be. All right. So you talk about all those things home maintenance, purchases. Even savings, you talk around them all together. The Bible is clear about it. Ecclesiastes 4, 8 to 12. Flash that on the board quickly. That's the first thing you're going to, I'm going to ask you to flash on the board. Ecclesiastes 4, you know it, but let's look at it again. 4, 8 to 12. All right, so those people there, where are you? <laughs> you see, they've just imagined that they'll just keep rattling. Uh, uh, no, let's look at it. Let's look in the scriptures a little bit. Are you there? Yes. Ah, it's still not there. Let's go ahead. It's there now. All right. <laughs> There's one alone without companion. That's where some of us are. He has neither son nor brother. Yet there is no end to all his labors. Nor is his eyes satisfied with riches. Keeps amassing wealth for himself. But never ask, who for whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? Say, this also is what? Vanity and a grave misfortune. Say, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they sell, one will lift up his companion. But what to him who is alone? When he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Eleven. Again, if the two lie together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And he says here, a threefold cord is not easily broken. So, pertinent question to ask ourselves as husband and wife on joint possessions, joint operations. Look, side of money matters. Say, how much money do we have? We must ask such questions. See, which are the ones that can be taken care of immediately? Which are the ones that should be deferred? How can we make more money? Of course, you see, when you are talking all of that, are you saying that there will be no disagreements? Eh? There will be. If there's one thing my wife I used to disagree on for a long time, it was on money matter. But we never went our different ways. But I realized that with time that, you see, we are always quarreling because we are poor. <laughs> The poverty is a bad thing. <laughs> you can quarrel over 1,000 one naira. <laughs> I realized that, yes. But we never went our different ways. That's the important thing. You see, which one should be deferred? How can we enhance our financial base? No, you know, and who moderate? Who's supposed to be moderating this discussion? Who is the person in charge? The husband, that's why men, God will help us. Let's work hard so that we have mouth to talk. <laughs> See? But some men, some women don't even engage their spouses in such discussions, especially when they are more boy and financial. You know, some women to mess up their husbands. Do you know that? Oh, yes, I know a number of them. <laughs> they don't behave as they like, dishing out peanuts to their husband. Uh, okay, what do you need? Uh, <laughs> uh, 3,000. No, 3,000 is too much. We can't afford it. Take this 1,000. Is that a woman? <laughs> now, thank you very much. God will bless you. <laughs> God will continue to bless you. 
They have turned their husbands to mumu. The Lord will have mercy on us. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's what is happening in some of our homes. And why are they doing that? Because they have hidden what? Agenda. Hidden agenda. They have some things they want to be doing privately without their carrying their wives, without carrying their husbands what? Along. See, much disagreement occur on money matters in a lot of homes because the couple operate what I call joint and secret personal financial structures. Eh? Whatever accounts I have, my wife's name is there. And of course, the same thing with her, even when she was still working. Eh? What does the Bible teach? I've already told us, Genesis 1.26. And Ephesians 5.21 tells us that loss of meeting to one another in the fear of God. What should be the bank details be? I've told you. Dr. Funcho and Mrs. Yabisi Omowo. It's not Dr. and Mrs. Funcho Omowo. You get my point? Anybody can be the missus in that one. <laughs> Praise God. And uh, I do not pray. Oh, we agree. Anybody, any of us can sign to collect money. Is it workable? Answer me now. Yes. If you say it is workable, is that all? Many of us, you discover that we are too selfish. We have it in what? Agenda. You see? What you have in various homes is strict delegation of responsibility to each other. And some husbands will say, okay, I'll take care of uh, uh, the house rent. I'll take care of the school fees. Now you take care of uh, feeding. And uh, all right, I'll give you some subsidy. Uh, miserable subsidy a lot of times. <laughs> At the end of the day, you know, when they are no longer able to pay those school fees and all that, who do they run to? Now, uh, please, uh, Borrow me. They always borrow you. <laughs> but never paying back. <laughs> they are too full of themselves. Uh, it's a shame. <laughs> yes. And when you begin to do that kind of a thing, love between you will die. Self-sufficiency kills love in marriage. I say that again. Self-sufficiency does what? Keeps love in marriage. And of course, you discover that it's the children and the women that suffer a lot of this mess in their homes. But there will be changes for the better. In Jesus' name. Financial, and then I talk about social matters. The married couple's joint physical presence and performance at various occasions, lends a lot of weight or some weight to the depth of their bonding and love for each other. You remember Aquila and Priscilla in the Bible? They were mentioned seven times in the New Testament. And always together. Through thick and thin. These are worthy examples. And of course, you will really jump to the conclusion that they, 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 they were good couples. They were fulfilled in each other. What made you to join to that conclusion? It's because you saw them together. You read about them together. Togetherness is so vital. Vital fidelity in marriage. But let us know that solo performance or appearance of early couples, I'm not talking about the situation where one is indisposed though. Oh yes. There's a good excuse for going alone. Solo performance most of the time raises some doubt about your unity of purpose and love for each other. Praise God. Whatever objections you have against your joint operations. You know, some husband and wife are not proud of each other. To work in each other's company. Maybe because it doesn't dress, it doesn't dress well. All those things should be sorted out. And my wife asks me, which one do I wear? Are you following me? Is this one good on that? We sort all those things out before going on. It's not when you get... I'm not, when some women are doing that with their husband, eh, they don't say, oh, oh, so let's go. Who is looking at you? Hmm? <laughs> and they go out, he start dodging. He start dodging now. All, all, all kinds of misbehavior. Going on between many husbands and wives. Sort all those things out before you set out. Eh? If you are going out, I'm talking to men now, maybe in another three weeks, you give your wife good notice. 
It's not when it's almost time. It's, ah, I want you to follow me. And he was, ah, you should have told me. Do you understand what I'm talking about? The togetherness, the fidelity should also be practiced in, the, in your financial involvement with relation, friends, and acquaintances. Anything we do is always Miss Doctor and Mrs. Funch or Mowo. If if you you are giving me an envelope for anything, you are appreciating me. Maybe you are doing ceremony or whatever. And I see there just one name, eh? uh, Mister Fidelis, whatever. And your wife is not there. I, I just decide these two are not together. And that's the truth. Are you getting what I'm saying? You must always carry yourself along with each other. That's what fidelity is all about. And why do you need to do that? You do that before friends, before acquaintances. You do all of that to guard against unholy alliances. When you go solo, Eh? You are a woman, you are always going solo. Some men may just begin to come around, begin to dance around you. Eh? A lady went for a um, wedding ceremony somewhere. Couldn't go with the husband. And one woman sat by her and started fidgeting. Oh, can I meet you? Can I do it? The woman, the woman said, What's wrong with you? Are you where? <laughs> and of course, when she got back home, he told her husband, Hey, darling, take your time. I'm still toastable. And then told the story of the man that was fidgeting around. <laughs> That's the way it should be. But some of you, you will go through all that. You keep a sealed lips. Hmm? Sinners in the church. God will deliver you. In Jesus' name. The last one. I must finish this, please. Please help me. They are also forthcoming and faithful to each other sexually. No matter the pressures on them from within and without. To do otherwise. Forthcoming. And faithful. Those are the two things I want to talk around. First coming first. A lot of married ladies do not realize. Listen now women. I talk to the men as well. That their husbands are more motivated than them sexually. By stronger instinct and awareness. They are more aware of it than yourselves. A lot of women don't know that. And because they don't know. They are very very insensitive. To their husband's sexual advances. They are at times intolerant. Hey, leave me alone. What do you want? Hmm? Hmm? Is every time? No. I'm not interested. Intolerance. Indifference. Some say, okay, they said, uh, don't refuse one another. Uh, then they are there in bed. They just lie down like a log of wood. Do what you want to do and let go. Leave me alone. Grudgingly. Indifference. These things happen in the homes. Are you following what I'm saying? On the other hand, some men exhibit impatience. They want to do the three, three, four, five minutes trouble and jump up and sleep up. They want to use their wife to induce sleep. They are not interested. In the, they don't cross check with the woman. They, don't, ah, I, uh, they want to come along this time around. They don't ask such questions because I know it's coming along will take a longer time. See, impatient, disregard for their wives. They use them as subjects. Now, moreover, a lot of couple might not be forthcoming sexually with each other as a result of what I call absence of sex appeals. Sex appeal. What do I call it? Answer me. You must listen to this. Sex appeal in form of glamour. What's glamour? Glamour is beauty that is sexually attractive. The smell around you, your hair cut, your hair do as a woman must be glistening, shining. Are you with me? <laughs> your outfit, your wears must be smart. Eh? Your weight, women. You know, women have to tell them to put on weight. They, they can't, a lot of them can't help it. But you must be seen to be doing something about it. Are you following me? And the man, the man says, eh, we are putting on weight. Eh, what, do you want, what do you want to do? I can't kill myself. Bro. It's not as if we don't know we are fat in my home. <laughs> there was one, the husband kept, kept telling her. And she, then he went and said, ice cream, come, ice cream, come. You start licking ice cream. Of course, that woman, both of them, will go silent. They are not talking to them again. Huh? And the woman will not. Uh, don't be annoyed. Don't be annoyed. The man was not happy with her. They reported themselves to me. I said, Dr. Mowell, she's not serious. Don't be annoyed. Is that a sign of sobriety? So I shouldn't be annoyed, but you can keep misbehaving. Is that what you're saying? 
you know, husband and wife. Voila, isn't it? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> yes. We're talking about what? Glamour. Your, your mouth care, mouth care. You must brush twice a day, morning and evening. That's what the dentists tell us. I, I, we don't have time to tell stories. Or what one and wife who quarrel over such things? One told her. One told her, his wife, you have no home training. Tell me that I should go and brush. It's my mouth smelling. What are you saying? <laughs> your accessories, those things, you, that, you know, your hair, your, your hat, your earring, your necklace, whatever that your husband wants you to do for him. That is not sinful. Those, all those things means what? Glamour, gesture. I'm talking about sex appeal. Which many of us don't pay attention to. We are too spiritual. Spirit, spirit, isn't it? And they are suffering. Both of them are suffering. Tolerating each other. Not enjoying each other. You know, we're talking about what? Gesture, gesture. I've talked about glamour. Gesture. What, what do you mean by gesture? Your action that shows your intention. That is gesture. Romantic statements to each other. Some men, it's only when they are in bed they begin to strike out their hands for the in-reach. The usual in-reach. Ordinarily, they, they, don't, uh, they, they, they don't even touch themselves. And the women hate such things. Are you following what I'm saying? I desire those things. Honoring her and the home with kind gestures. Gestures. What are, what are gestures? Little, little, I mean, Okay, let, let's, look, let's look at Songs of Solomon. This is the second passage we are going to look into. Songs of Solomon 5, 3 to 5. Guess so. Action to show your intention. Solomon, uh, Songs of Solomon 5, 3 to 5. Quickly, that's the last passage. Now we'll begin to pray soon. All right. What is it? All right, thank you. Read, read, read it. So, I've taken off my robe. How can I put it on? The, the, the woman talking. I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? My beloved put his hands and by the latch of the door, and my heart yearned for him. I rose to open for my beloved, and my hands dropped with mare, my fingers with liquid mare on the handles of the rock. You know, I open for no, let's leave it as that. Let's have put on my dress. That's a gesture. I told you earlier on, women are mot- men are motivated by what they see of their wives. But w- women are motivated by what they hear their husbands tell them. So you must trade your nakedness. Feel it with your husband in your bedroom. Praise God. Praise God. All right. <laughs> see? So, bearing all forms of uh, dis- dissatisfaction... Husband and wife should ensure fulfillment in each other. Don't just say all out together. The husband in particular should take his wife to the peak of the experience. That is orgasm. Each time they desire, each, each time she desires it. Never in a hurry to use his wife as a sex object or induce sleep. You know, those of you were trained by me, you know, for over 30 years, you understand what I'm talking about. I took you this, through this particular lecture, sex in marriage. You know, Praise God. Now, that is being forthcoming. The last one, being faithful. That's, you need to be faithful to each other. Ephesians 5, verse 3. It says there, let fornication and adultery, let it not for once be mentioned among you as become saints. I can say it and say it over and over again. I've been married for 43 years. And I've never related sexually with any other person other than my wife. To the glory of God. So, what I'm telling you, is I'm not a hypocrite. Praise God. No, so in order to be faithful to each other, married and engaged partners should ensure steadfastness and continuous growth in their love for Christ. You must be a growing Christian. You must also be growing the knowledge of the word of God. The Bible says, Joshua 1, 8. This book of the Lord shall not uh, depart from your mouth. You must meditate upon it day and night. That you may take time to do all that is written therein. He said, that is when you will know good success. 
That will give us understanding. So, being faithful, you make sure you avoid all people, all places, all prints, publications, programs, etc. on TV, all posts on your cell phone. You keep receiving those posts on your cell phone. Alluring ones. Or you don't get them. You don't get them. What do you do with those things? Immediately you delete. Some of you will save it for future, to, you know, to sort it out in the future. You are deceiving yourselves. Hmm? You delete it immediately. Because all these things, they encourage the natural human tendencies towards sexual immorality. And nobody is exempted. Nobody is exempt from those temptations. That's why you must work hard to make sure that you don't fall victims. I don't fall victims in Jesus' name. Because cause of sexual immorality, I mentioned some of them earlier on, guilty conscience, and stained marital relationships, secrecy, slipperiness, snappy, snobbish responses, and of course, total destruction of love. Between engaged and married couples, go and read the story of Amnon and Tamar. They were so much in love, but the moment Amnon had kind of knowledge of her, he hated her. And that's the way it works. That's the way this marriage thing works. When you begin to taste the unforbidden fruit, your legal house, the whole of them, because it's tasteful to you. That's why it's a no-go area. Of course, apart from that, as sexually transmitted diseases, there are complications in males, gonorrhea, electric. You no, know, some men, today, they can't pass urine very well. Their, their urinary passage is, eh, is narrowed down as a result of what? Infection. We call it what? Urethra structure. You see them in surgical world. They're always crying. Uh, yes. People will reap what they sow. Are you with me? Those who sow to the flesh will reap what? Corruption. Those who sow to the spirit will reap what? Life everlasting. Women too. Perfect inflammatory disease. That's what we call it. See? Menstrual disorder. The menses are no longer regular. Some of them, their menses stops. It won't come again. Infertility problems. Of course, you know... <laughs> The, 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 the straw that has broken the camel's back for years now, HIV, isn't it? HIV. HIV is still on course. So I hope you know that. It's still on call. People are still getting it. And worst if anybody who is involved in sexual immorality, it becomes entrapped. It's trapped. To come out becomes what? A problem. That's why it's a no-go area. And the final thing is that that fellow, if he's not able to come out of it, if he doesn't repent from it, he's going to hell straight away. Praise the Lord. I must close. Sorry. I've taken some almost 10 extra minutes. See? Beloved, the requirements in deep bonding, marital fidelity, between covenant husbands and wives, they are colossal. We can't exhaust talking around them. Perhaps unfathomable. That's why everyone must repent from all shortcomings. And if you do that, times of refreshing and marital bliss shall come from the presence of the Lord. Acts 3.19. Revelation 3.5. Let's rise to our feet. Let's rise to our feet. Let's begin to talk to God. Marital fidelity. We begin to score, let's begin to score ourselves. There's no point having my, you know, uh, family program every year, year in year out, routine, and nothing changes. People are not sober, people are not penitent, people don't do the needful. Hmm? Let's talk to God. You are a husband, you are a wife. Some of the things you have had this day, you know you are not doing them. And they are all from the word of God. I have not talked from myself, from my, you know, from my mind. Pray, all and while you need to come together, sit down together, and sort these things out. Talk around them. Otherwise, I tell you, mm, God will have mercy. Maybe you are here this morning. You have heard this message. You have not yet repented from a life of sin. Or you are already repented, but you discover that you know, some of these things you have, they, they are still having their cause in your life. You know, these negative stops that must be put behind you. You can come out. We will pray together. And I believe God. You have good stories to tell. Thereafter, 
in the mighty name of Jesus. Anybody who wants to be prayed for this morning, along the lines that we have spoken, please come forward. Let my wife come and pray with you. I'll pray for you in Jesus' name. Shall we pray? In Jesus' name. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you. For you are good all the time. We can come to you. Thank you for your word we have heard this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the impact it has made in our lives. Lord, you know us as individuals. You know the things that are going on in our hearts. You know the things that, are go- that have happened in our homes. And you know how it is with each one of us. Father, we lift up ourselves into your hand and we pray that in the name of Jesus, every heart here, Father Lord, will have a touch from you in the name of Jesus. You know where the woman is hurting? You know where the man is hurting? You know, Lord, where the man is overbearing? You know where the woman is overbearing? We we'll plead and pray that this morning will not be for fun. You would bring about a change in each person in the name of Jesus. Give us a desire to comply with your word. Father, give us a desire to please you even in our marriage. Father, we plead and pray that you will help each one of us to know that we are responsible to you for our marriages. Father, help us, O Lord, that your name will be glorified. Father, we plead and pray For those who seem to not know what to do, they are saying, I don't know how I can help myself. We'll plead and pray that God, in your own way, you would send them help in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you. Blessed be your name, O Lord. We give you praise. Teach us, Lord, to learn from you. Teach us, Father, not to take your word lightly. Thank you, our Father. We bless you, Lord. We worship you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray.